The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to Into the Impossible, a podcast of stories, ideas, and speculations from the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. I'm Sheldon Brown, director of the Clarke Center. Today's episode is about how we imagine the impossible in four parts and two homework problems. Imagining the impossible is how every great innovation begins. Some people say we can't do this thing. A bunch of other people agree and say it's impossible. So of course, then somebody, usually somebody kind of odd, says, no, let's imagine the impossible is possible. What then? What would things look like? What could we do? It's that kind of thinking that gives our podcast its title, which comes from a quote by our namesake, Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who said that the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Today, the Clark Center's Patrick Coleman will take us on a journey into the imaginations of three scientists and a poet. We'll hear from MIT physicist David Kaiser, along with Pulitzer Prize-winning poet Ray Armentrout, and mathematician, physicist, and public intellectual Freeman Dyson. Along the way, we're going to touch on a range of topics from how to detect gravitational waves to how the hippies saved physics, from the history of science to the metaphors of science, from the birth of the universe to the creation of poetry about the birth of the universe. Thanks, Sheldon. We are going to cover a lot of ground in this episode. But to start with, let's not call it homework. Let's call it a thought experiment. David Kaiser, the Germanhausen Professor of the History of Science at MIT, recently sat down with UC San Diego astrophysicist and Clark Center affiliate Brian Keating. And here he is describing this exercise he gives to his undergraduate students. Pretend that you're an assistant in the editorial office of the Annalen de Physique, the journal where Einstein published his mm-hmm. most important papers in 1905. <laughs> so imagine, so at the time, Max Planck, the great um, sort of founding figure of quantum theory, was the editor sure. of, of this journal. These are the four famous Annus Mirabilis papers, or Miracle Year papers, that Einstein published while still a patent clerk. You know, one of these would become known as the special theory of relativity, and another gave us the equation E equals mc squared. So you could say that they had a pretty profound effect on the modern understanding of physics. So as you imagine, you were, you know, Planck's assistant, and he hands you this weird-looking submission from a not very well-known person named Albert Einstein. Uh, Write a referee report. Right. Right. So in the humanities, we call that a a close reading of a primary source. Mm -hmm. We do that all the time with poetry, with anything. Mm -hmm. But in physics class, they have to, you know, write an essay that takes the words on the page um, seriously and engages with the argument. What's the structure of the argument? How would you evaluate it? And I always say that the, the clever students will reject the paper. It's a crazy paper. It it shouldn't be published. It's ridiculous. Um, And so it's a way to to get a little creative, you know, put yourself in another perspective, pretend we haven't had more than 100 years of textbook knowledge of special relativity. Mm -hmm. What if this really was falling out of nowhere from some unknown person, you know, not in the centers of of, uh, learning at the time? And, you know, take the paper at face value. What do you make of it? And so that's – again, that's like a baby step compared to the creative things people can do. Um, but it, I think it's extremely helpful just to get students to, to practice articulating ideas and concepts, making arguments, frankly, making mistakes. Mm-hmm. It's incredibly important um, in formats other than or, or complementary to multivariable calculus, which mm-hmm. is also incredibly important. Yeah. Mistakes aren't something scientists like to talk about. There are the usual reasons. It's embarrassing to talk about one's mistakes, but – In a larger sense, it's a product of how science is taught. As students, we receive these theories and ideas and equations fully formed and often thoroughly tested. We don't learn about the bumps along the road for the people who came up with them in the first place. But of course, scientists, and even genius scientists, are people, and people make mistakes, especially when they're attempting something new, when they're trying to imagine how something impossible may not only be possible, but true to reality. In part, this comes out of a fear of learning bad habits of mind, that if you teach students how physics went wrong, you'll teach them, intentionally or not, to make the same mistakes. Here's Brian on an encounter with this kind of thinking in an undergrad history of science class. 
I remember taking um, taking a history of science uh, class at Case Western, where I was an undergraduate in the in the nineties, and the 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 teacher I think uh, turned me off a little bit because they said uh, he said at the time, and I, and I don't remember who it is, and I'm I'm glad I don't because uh, <laughs> it, it was an, it was a good class, but but the first day of class said we don't teach physics historically because were you to do that, you learn about all the wrong paths that people have taken, and it might imprint on on the human mind, you know this residual uh, imprint, shall we say, that uh, of the wrong answer. You know, mm-hmm. sort of like, you know, if you taught your kid every day that there's, you know, three planets in the solar system, you know, eventually you'd, you'd, uh, you'd be very hard to break this deep inculcation of, of uh, indoctrination almost. And here's David with an example of his own. There was a famous, I mean, famous in my small little world, so famous, we have to normalize, uh, but a well-known article in the journal Science, you know, the prestigious journal mm-hmm. um, in, in many of our fields. And it was published in the, I think, the early 1970s by a very prominent historian of science. And the title is what stuck with me. The title was, Should the History of Science Be Rated X? Which is a very, that catches your attention, right? <laughs> and the argument was, I think, very much like what you're describing, Brian. Was, is this stuff sort of um, going to derail young science students instead of clarifying things? And it was, it was phrased as a question. It was a provocative question. So, I mean, for decades, for generations, people have wondered um, – you know, how, to, how to get that right. I mean, a lot of departments of the history of science, of which there are now many, many throughout the United States and right. other parts of the world, many of them were founded or at least given a, a strong institutional basis soon after World War II. Uh, and not coincidentally, the idea was we now live in a nuclear age. Mm-hmm. The um, sort of power of science and technology to shape um, world history dramatically and perhaps even overnight, that seemed like a whole new era of, of humanity's relationship with science and technology. And so many uh, earnest educators uh, and reformers thought, well, the history of science could be a bridge for young students who did not feel interested in the sciences right. to at least get a kind of grounding about sci- forms of scientific reasoning, mm-hmm. um, if not to become great scientists themselves themselves than to be members of an informed citizenry. You know, this is stuff we could never ignore ever again. Was was the notion? I think it's some. I think that's right. I think it's some something. Um, I think they captures something important mm-hmm. in in that very you know dramatic time of the, of the mid and late nineteen forties. Um, and so, so sometimes history of science can function as a kind of physics for poets. You know, introduce something about the way scientists think about the world to non scientist uh, students. And I think there's certainly value in that. On the other hand, uh, does it encourage the notion that everything we're doing is going to be wrong tomorrow, or you know, setting up blind spots and so on? And hopefully, it doesn't do that. Now, speaking of blind spots, why don't we look at Einstein's? We started the show with him, and the name Einstein has become more or less synonymous with infallible genius in our culture, so I think he can handle us using him as an example. David's thought experiment from the beginning asks us to try to imaginatively experience just how unusual and unorthodox and seemingly impossible Einstein's early ideas must have sounded at the time. But that's hard to do. How do we understand Einstein as a person in a moment of history a hundred years ago, beyond nearly every living person's experience? How important is it that we don't forget Einstein's errors along with his accomplishments? Let's go back to David and Brian. Of course, this is the uh, the second half of the hundredth anniversary. You know, it's nice to stretch out these anniversaries exactly. as long as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's the hundredth uh, anniversary, centennial, if you will, of the uh, of the theory of general relativity. So mm-hmm. Einstein's famous theory, first published in 1915, 1916. I, I do believe the prediction of gravitational radiation was predicted in 1916. Paper is that correct? That's right. So he did first write it down in 1916, made a couple of errors, which is nice mm-hmm. for the rest of us. Like That's he right. got signs wrong. <laughs> and factors of two and mess things up. Yep. Uh, but he did, in fact, begin to explore that uh, in print in 1916. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, whenever you feel, um, you know, sufficiently uh, hubristic about yourself, you look at a, a paper that Einstein wrote in Nature magazine where he talks about um, how he was visited by a, a friend of his, a Mr. Mr. Mandel or Mendel, who came by to perform a little calculation. And that leads <laughs> to the entire theory of gravitational lensing, for right. which uh, we're quite familiar with today. But like gravitational lensing, my recollection is that Einstein didn't believe we would ever detect gravitational waves. Is that correct? That's exactly right. If it, so first of all, when he first wrote it down, he figured this would never, ever be detectable. Right. The signal would always be too small. You have to remember in 1916, um, you know, the world's astronomers still weren't sure whether there was um, 
whether the entire universe was just the Milky Way galaxy or if there were separate galaxies outside of our own. The entire field of what we now call extragalactic astronomy didn't even exist. So Einstein had in mind, you know, fairly modest size nearby sources, stars kind of like our sun, and he just put some numbers in and, and the numbers look – the strains that you'd predict are just – I mean, even smaller than the incredibly small ones that LIGO now can, can really measure. Um, you know, another factor which um, some physicists and historians have looked at in some detail uh, is how Einstein and really all the experts reversed themselves almost like a sine wave, mm-hmm. oscillating, mm-hmm. saying not just would it be too small to detect – are they required? Must gravitational waves be part of the theory or are they forbidden? Hmm. You must have them. You can't have them. It's like, you know, I can't pay the rent. I must pay the rent. <laughs> um, and so for – and that spanned not just for a few months. That, that was over decades. Uh, mm-hmm. Einstein and really all the other – the great experts uh, in the world on general relativity really struggled for years um, – to figure out whether gravitational waves, even in principle, are part of the theory, let alone right. they could, whether they could be observed. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And of course, we should, we should mention the fact this podcast is being recorded in, in June of 2016. And it was just in February of 2016 that your colleagues at MIT uh, and those at Caltech and really around the world announced the first direct detection of gravitational wave. Um, what was the reaction like on campus when that uh, announcement was made? You know, it, it, was, it was pretty amazing. So, um, you know, MIT is known as a party school. I think that's basic reputation. That's right. Um, and, but we lived up to it that time. It was, it was great. You know, I have many good friends who've worked on that project for their whole scientific lives I and mean, for decades, decades and decades. Right. Uh, I've gotten to know um, not just folks who are sort of my age or a bit younger, and it's incredibly exciting f- to see their work you know, come together like that, but also Ray Weiss, who, who certainly helped dream this whole thing up back in the late 60s. Just to interject here quickly, Ray or Rainer Weiss is Professor Emeritus of Physics at MIT. He was one of the leaders behind LIGO, or the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which consists of two interferometers, one in Hanford, Washington, and the other in Livingston, Louisiana. These would allow the LIGO team to detect gravitational waves, which Einstein himself had considered impossible only a hundred years before. Which brings us to the second part of our show and the second homework problem. Here's David again talking about Ray Weiss's role in the beginnings of this historic discovery. The story's come out now a lot since the LIGO announcement, but he really assigned this as a homework problem for an undergraduate course right. in something like 1968. <laughs> you know, calculate what it'd be like to try to design an interferometer, this particular kind of detection mechanism um, that could maybe, maybe, just maybe, you know, spot these things. And he had an incredible, he faced an incredible uphill battle um, writing proposal after proposal in the early 70s, being rejected. Um, people thought it really was a kind of harebrained scheme. He, he recalls with, with great clarity that even right in MIT's own department, let alone in the field more broadly, people said that'll never work. It's kind of crackpot stuff. They would try to dissuade graduate students from working on it. Uh, so, I mean, it's a testament not just to Ray's, you know, great, great skills and, and creativity as a scientist, but also his, his um, you know, stick to mm-hmm. his, his stubbornness, basically. Right. Um, and, and it really, honestly, I, frankly, I kind of choked up um, mm-hmm. upon hearing the announcement to see Ray be here to enjoy it. Not just right. that he's alive, which he is, but he's yeah. active. He's, Vibrant. you know, he's in his 80s. He's an emeritus professor, and yet he's in a lab, you know, mm-hmm. practically every day, flying to all the sites. He's incredibly involved. And so to be able to see Ray, you know... Um, be there as it came together was that, that felt especially you know special yeah, for me and for many of us yeah yeah I mean it's it's really um, you know, a triumph on many different levels both from the theoretical first predictions to the to the uh, the signal itself which which astounded people mm-hmm. uh, the significance of capturing uh, the the final death embrace of two uh, black holes uh, ca- caught together um, lasting only a quarter of a second or so yeah. right so this is this is quite fascinating. That sound you're hearing is the sound of that cosmic death embrace. Well, kind of. LIGO measures the tiniest ripples in space-time reaching Earth caused by passing gravitational waves. These waves are created by the most massive high-energy events in the universe. Things like when a star goes supernova or when two neutron stars or two black holes collide. The sound you're hearing, that little chirp, That was created by two black holes about 29 and 36 times the mass of the sun. The black holes themselves crashed into each other 1.3 billion years ago. 
As the two drew closer and closer, they began to lose more energy, energy that was emitted as gravitational waves. In the final instance of the collision, the two black holes were moving toward one another at nearly half the speed of light. As they formed a single black hole, one with as much mass as 62 suns, three solar masses were converted to energy in the form of a powerful burst of gravitational waves. These are big scales, huge amounts of energy. But that's what you hear when you hear that little chirp. But is this really the sound of two black holes colliding? Well, no. The gravitational waves created by that cataclysmic event are invisible and inaudible. They were translated to sound by the scientists who detected them in order to generate what we hear. So technically, they're a representation of a collision, an oral metaphor, so to speak. Which brings us to part three. Ray Armentrout, the Pulitzer Prize-winning author of many books of poetry, writes often about such cosmological events and ideas with uncommon wit and precision. I spoke with her recently at her home about this idea of the metaphors of physics and the challenges of visualizing the invisible. The only way that you can actually try to understand, quote unquote, what you might read about, say, quantum mechanics is really metaphorically. You, I mean, you can try to visualize it, but the visualization is a metaphor. The only actual, you know, facts, if you will, or data is, are, is mathematics. And, you know, if you don't read mathematics, <laughs> or maybe even if you do, I mean, I think it's just a natural tendency of the human mind to not only visualize, but when you visualize something that, that actually is invisible, then you're uh, creating a, um, an analogy, you're creating a kind of double for it, and that's a sort of metaphor. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, metaphorical understanding is just natural. You can't get away from it. But it, it, if you take metaphor literally, it can be misleading. And here's David with an example of his own. Another thing I've, I've, I've come to enjoy doing a lot of um, post-tenure, frankly, when I can afford to try to do these things, is try to um, give myself license or, and or force myself to try to write a short kind of access, hopefully accessible or popular piece about some of my physics research in ways that, of course, we can't get away with publishing in the, the physical sure, review. Right. Um, and I do it partly because I think it's fun. I'd like to think other people would find this stuff interesting. Um, I certainly, you know, still do. Um, but also because it's a way for me to test myself. Do I really, really get what's going on? Mm -hmm. Because the math is beautiful and often very elegant. But that is that's that's one kind of description mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. And do I really did I did I lull myself and saying, well, everyone's done that mathematical trick, so that must just be fine? Could I tell a story about that? Could I could I narrate what I think conceptually just happened there? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really fun, and all, and all, that's like it feels like a good uh, challenge for right. myself. And so I get to look forward to you know working hard on this on a certain paper, work with my students, and try to get it really just right and tight, really tight and mm -hmm. succinct for our journals. Um, and then imagine often whimsical or kind of anthropomorphic or what if, you know, the electron had feelings kind mm -hmm. of thing <laughs> and tell a little story that captures metaphorically the gist. It's not really an analogy. It's mm -hmm. not, I'm not trying to set up a one-to-one -one correspondence. I think that might be a little too tight mm -hmm. maybe um, – uh, would lead us down the wrong path. But metaphorically, does this convey the gist of what I think that beautiful analysis of mathematics might be suggesting? In part, we use metaphors to visualize these kinds of things because they're so hard to make sense of without it. When we're talking about two black holes colliding, what reference point could any of us have for understanding the event in a simple, declarative, literal kind of way? It's like that with a lot of the big questions science tries to answer. How did the universe begin? Why is there something instead of nothing? In her essay, Cosmology and Me, Ray Armentrout talks about getting her taste for these kinds of ultimate questions and metaphor by way of her evangelical mother who understood the stories of the Bible literally. The earth was created in seven 24-hour days. The Garden of Eden was a physical geographical location. But for Ray, who no longer considers herself religious, there was always a tension between, in her words, the singularity of event and the promiscuity of metaphor, between the Garden of Eden as a place 
and the garden as a metaphor for the beginnings of humanity or for the womb. One of the wonderful things about how science appears in Ray's poems is that the concepts are conveyed as precisely as she represents the difficulty in making sense of these concepts. Here she walks us through how a poem began with the voice of Morgan Freeman, who so often plays God himself in the movies, and evolved through her own questions about how light became matter at the birth of the universe and through a conversation with Brian Keating. I think it was in 2012 I happened to watch a show about the birth of the universe, I think Morgan Freeman was narrating, as he, all, as he often does, to give it that proper gravitas. Mm -hmm. Space itself exploded in a burst of radiant energy. In those first dazzling moments, the newborn universe began to expand and cool. And, um... He was talking about how something about how the energy from the Big Bang produced light, which somehow uh, transformed into matter. And, you know, I, I mean, I know obviously about E equals MC squared and all that, but, you know, if this was true, if his description was true, what caused it to suddenly, does it always at a certain point transform into matter, or was there some precipitating, I mean, I just had questions. I couldn't quite visualize this. So, and many times I can't quite visualize things that I read about either quantum physics or uh, cosmology, and that's exactly why it sort of sometimes sparks me to write poems, because it leaves me puzzled and it leaves me still thinking. But in this case, I thought, well, since it was summer and I had time on my hands, I thought, well, why don't I get in touch and see if there's a real physicist who would sit down with me, have lunch or something, and have a conversation about my questions. Just for fun, let's hear Brian recounting getting this email out of the blue. She ended up writing me an email about six years ago. And she said, um, you know, hi, uh, Professor Keating. You know, uh, my name's Ray. Um, you know, I, I have some ideas about cosmology, and I'd, and I'd like to get together with you and talk about them. Mm -hmm. And so my finger was reaching for the delete key. <laughs> right. you know, I'm sure you get these emails. You know, yes. all of us physicists get these Einstein was wrong kind of emails. Right. But she was very interested in, in, in cosmology and wanted to have coffee. I thought, well, I can buy my own coffee. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, they don't you – know, they pay me enough to do that here right. in the University Good. of California. Um, and so before I deleted it, I saw the – oh, by the way, I won the Pulitzer Prize in poetry in 2010 from President Obama. I said, whoa, let me retract, you know. <laughs> Yes. Right. And uh, we ended up getting together and we talked a lot about uh, cosmology and just modern concepts. And back to Ray's meeting with Brian. So I think it was the summer of 2012. We had lunch at the loft and I, I had sort of written down some questions. I don't remember exactly what they were, but they were along the lines that I just described. And, you know, he, he managed to give me the sense that my... Uh, what I had gathered, unsurprisingly, from Morgan Freeman was uh, <laughs> too simplistic and was not really right. And then he went on to explain, but most of his explanations were, of course, over my head. Um, but that wasn't really the end of it, because I kept thinking about it. And I, you know, I appreciated him taking the time and enjoyed the conversation. Um, and after, after I got home, you know, several days in... I started writing a, basically a, you might say, a fictionalized account of our conversation. And that, that's the poem Accounts, which I dedicated to Brian. It's not exactly me and Brian. I mean, it, was, it doesn't repeat anything that he said to me, and I don't think it repeats anything that I said to him, not word for word. But it catches some of, at least some of my quizzicalness. And it's kind of... It's kind of comical, uh, but it's because I, redu I tend to reduce things, my questions, to the sort of most bald and basic, um, you know, ways that you could ask. But it's serious, too. So I'll read that. Accounts for Brian Keating. Light was on its way from nothing to nowhere. Light was all business. Light was full speed when it got interrupted. Interrupted by what? When it got tangled up and broke into opposite. Broke into brand new things 
What kinds of things? Drinking cup? Thinking of you? Convenience valet? How could speed take shape? Hush. Do you want me to start over? The fading laser pulse, information describing the fading laser pulse, is stored, is encoded, in the spin states of atoms. God is balancing his checkbook. God is encrypting his account. This is taking forever. It's not like Brian ever said, hush, do you want me to start over? That, that didn't happen. But <laughs> That doesn't sound like him. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of talking to myself here, but it's, you know, two, two different characters talking about the issue. Writing poetry for me is a way of responding to, to the world, obviously, but, but mainly to things that puzzle me or trouble me or just engage me somehow and leave me thinking. Though she was drawn to the promiscuity of metaphor, like David, she sees that metaphors drawn from contemporary science can be, at times too promiscuous. Here we got talking about the tricky nature of too loose an understanding of the science of play. Another thing that I really enjoy about your poems is how funny they are and and your attention to some of the strange valences of like, everyday speech or um, especially like the language of advertising or mm-hmm. the ways that you know, mm-hmm. other kinds of registers of language kind of sneak into the poems or find a place mm-hmm. in the poems. Um, and so I, I just wanted to know if, if there are aspects of uh, the language of science writing or popular science or futurism or a lot of this, these kinds of, um, you know, what we at the Clark Center are, are talking a lot about, you know, speculative culture. Mm-hmm. Are, there, are there aspects of the language of speculative culture that you're critical of or that like, intrigue you? By speculative culture, are you partly meaning sci-fi? Including sci-fi. And actually, I was just thinking about your poem that um, deals with Star Trek. Was it Next Generation? Is <laughs> yeah, that, is that yeah. the poem? Which is just a really funny poem. <laughs> you have to remember Star Trek Next Generations to get that, which is now becoming, you know, sort of way back there in the past. The well, younger, thanks to younger Netflix, generations. everyone's watching it again. Yeah, they are. It is, okay. I think it's very popular. Good. <laughs> Yeah, this time we aren't the Borg. (laughs) We Western civilization, of course. I don't read much sci-fi. I like Ursula Le Guin, but... Well, I mean, even like, you know, popular science writing or, you know, the ways that research in cosmology or physics or, you know, particle physics or quantum Mm -hmm. mechanics gets talked about in, you know, kind of everyday everyday life. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, that gets very irritating because... It's not the writers I'm talking about. They write well and seriously, but some people draw the wrong conclusions. I mean, you know, I I give a reading, um, I guess it was somewhere at a university uh, or a college, Pratt, it was at Pratt. Mm -hmm. And one of the, there was a QA and a afterwards, and one guy basically asked if, you know, as if I was an expert, right, if, if what we're learning about quantum physics means that, you know, the future is absolutely open for anyone. And I was going, like, any particle? <laughs> I guess. If, I'm not an expert, but I pro- I'm pretty sure it's not you we're talking about. <laughs> so, yeah, there are people who try to get a license from, <laughs> from particle physics to think that, you know, tomorrow they'll learn to walk through walls. It's quantum tunneling for me. <laughs> Don't try it at home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, maybe a little wish, wishful thinking. It's hard to resist but, wishful but it's, thinking. It's, it's everywhere, you know. There, um, I've got a friend, I won't say her name, but who can get into that. And I, I find that sort of um, troubling the way that it can just sort of slide over into sort of new ageism. Of course, there's something human about trying to project ourselves into these often invisible, difficult-to-understand ideas. It's something Ray's poems create a space for. It's why the LIGO scientists converted that detection of gravitational waves into something you can hear, the chirp heard around the world. It's one thing to describe a concept mathematically or technically, but another to understand it or express it. We don't want to hear that chirp because it conveys information exactly. The sound stirs our imagination in a way that information on paper doesn't quite convey. This was one of the reasons Ray and Brian taught a course together called 
poetry for physicists. That, of course, is a sort of uh, reversal of the course that's taught at many universities and colleges called Physics for Poets. Mm -hmm. And Physics for Poets is basically physics for humanities students who don't have the math chops to take real physics. And we weren't trying to do exactly the reverse of that. We weren't trying to imply that any physics students who were attracted to this class, just it's because they didn't have any language skill. It wasn't that. It's more, um, I guess it started, at least with in, for Brian, it started because he thought that hard science students um, will have to probably write about their work and talk about their work. And they don't get much practice at that. They spend a lot of time doing calculations and experiments, and they don't spend much time with either oral or uh, written communication. And so this would be a, a situation in which they would do that. And why poetry? Well, maybe just because he met me. Uh, and that's what. <laughs> and I was attracted to the idea because it seems to me that, you know, at least there's a superficial resemblance, at least, uh, in what mathematicians and physicists are interested in and what poets do. I mean, poets in their work often link really uh, diverse ideas. That's, that's what a metaphor does. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they, they make unlikely pairings and try to make them work. They bring things together and say, well, maybe to, to put it in the, you know, the most bald way, this is like that. And that's what an equation does, too. And what's more, a good poet tries to make his or her expressions really succinct and condensed. And I think that's what a good um, equation does, right? It, it strips away everything unnecessary when it's elegant. And then also that idea of elegance. Um, mathematicians and physicists have often, at least some of them, spoken of the beauty or elegance of certain equations. And, of course, beauty is traditionally associated with the arts. I mean, in postmodern times, we often question whether beauty isn't subjective and whether there is such a thing as a, any, if there's a universal meaning to beauty at all. Right. But still, you can't quite divorce the idea of the arts from the idea of beauty, and beauty comes into science too, especially those particular sciences that have something to do with symmetries. Which brings us to part four. Now we're going to turn back to where we began, to how the human experience fits into the scientific pursuit. For this, Brian offers a metaphor by way of Apollo pilot Buzz Aldrin. There's a wonderful book called Digital Apollo. Um, yes, by uh, my colleague, your course, colleague at uh, David MIT. Mendel. Yes, and it explores the you know this notion of man versus machine, which mm -hmm. I also feel is is a metaphor for for what we do in physics. It's sort of you know nature's out there, and mm -hmm. we men and women are trying to to unravel the secret. But one one thing that always struck me is that. At the last minute, every single Apollo landing, the uh, the pilot, the lander, uh, you know, who's accomplishing the landing and flying it down, he had to take over at the last minute mm -hmm. and say, "Oh, mm -hmm. there was a boulder in the way." And the yes. and the autopilot, the automatic sensing, you know, capability. Everybody likes to say, "Oh, well, my watch has more power than mm -hmm. that." But actually, the autopilots of that time invented at MIT with uh, Sperry and other companies in right. the Northeast there. They were capable of complete automated landing mm -hmm. on this body, you know, a quarter of a million miles away from That's Earth. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but at the last moment, the human had to intervene and become mm -hmm. part and take over the control loop. Because what else is the expression of the pilot besides the landing? As a historian of science, David Kaiser likewise has a deep appreciation for the human side of physics, the paths people took toward great discoveries, and the importance of an exciting and popular understanding of science. Here he is speaking about his own beginnings. It sounds cliche, I know, but it has to be said, a lot of incredibly inspiring teachers from really from when I was young all the way through and consistently. And that was, uh, again, in hindsight, just in a remarkable um, gift, stroke of luck, you know, and people who really from when I was really pretty young could say, you know, this, is, this stuff is interesting and you can do it. You can think about it. Um, there's no reason not to go explore that as well. And so to have that constant encouragement, you know, help me when I made my errors, which indeed I made some, almost as many as Einstein, maybe more, I don't know. Um, but also to couple that with saying it is a human quest, it's a human pursuit, but it's one that's done by humans, not by, you know, kind of demigods on the hill. Mm -hmm. that we, you can do it, we can do it. Mm -hmm. And looking back, I, it's hard to overemphasize how important that was for me personally mm -hmm. and 
I think for many of us in the field. Um, so, you know, I, I was really interested in um, NASA and space exploration as a kid, like many, many kids, yeah. uh, I think. And I would paper my walls with posters. You know, I didn't have like rock stars on my walls. I had Neil Armstrong mm-hmm. and the Apollo 11 crew and uh, space shuttle, you know, posters. Um, so I was way into that. And um, and then that, you know, that fostered a, a broader interest in astronomy, astrophysics, physics um, centrally. And so even as a kid in uh, in junior high and high school, I was reading tons and tons of popular books, including actually books by Arthur C. Clarke. I mean, mm-hmm. so I'm especially delighted to be here for yeah. this podcast because, uh, I mean, I think, again, I mean, very, very good broad company to say I was so inspired by his own work and his imagination. Um, I had just devoured his books um, as a kid. And so, um, so that got me, you know, more and more curious about asking more and reading more kind of fun, popular books. In hindsight, also, Brian, you and I are the same age. Looking back, we grew up in a kind of golden era for popular science writing, at least in the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, that wasn't, I didn't know that at the time, of course, but other historians and literature scholars and others have done some really interesting work on the kind of boom and bust cycles in publishing on popular science for broad audiences, for non specialists. And the, 1970s, especially the 1980s, were actually a really great era for that um, and got really kicked into into high gear, a flourishing industry that now we, we all get to enjoy today. So I was totally a kind of popular science junkie as a kid. I was watching, you know, Cosmos on PBS before there were, you know, DVRs to watch it at my convenience. My, my <laughs> father and I would stay up and, you know, watch them on, on – uh, on PBS each Sunday night, I think it was, uh, and and then reading all these wonderful popular books by people like Paul Davies and John Gribben and, and many many more, many uh, you know very very talented physicists who then also had extremely rare talent to write for for non specialists as well and capture some of that excitement. So I would just gobble those up uh, as quickly as I could. And now let us hear from one of the great writer physicists of the 20th century, Freeman Dyson who visited the Clark Center for a live conversation with David Brin and Adam Bergasser, which included him recounting how he imagined his own way into a life in physics because of a book that humanized mathematicians and the dramatic events of World War II. I uh, had two gifts uh, uh, which were clear from the beginning, that I enjoyed calculating and I enjoyed writing. and, and So those are the two, two skills which have kept me going all these years. And, and uh, so already, as a child, I just loved numbers and I loved calculating. And, and calculating numbers was, was what I did. And, and uh, so I got into number theory quite early and, and uh, fell in love with it. And of course I read this marvelous book, Men of Mathematics, by E.T. Bell, who was a professor at Caltech. And, and, uh, and a science fiction author. A very good science fiction author, and, and so this book, Men of Mathematics, unfortunately, well, the, the, there's only one half of a chapter devoted to a woman mathematician. But apart from that, it's a very good survey of what mathematicians are really like, and it gave you this wonderful picture of the great mathematicians all the way back to Pythagoras. And they're human beings. They're people mostly quite flawed and, and people with, with, with ambitions and, and unpleasant personalities. So people, <laughs> all, they were really human beings, and if they could do mathematics, why shouldn't you? And, and mm-hmm. So this book actually caused many of the young people of my generation to become mathematicians. It, it, it certainly fired me with the ambition. If, 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 if some lunatic like George Bull could do it, then I should certainly do it too. And anyway, so I became a pure mathematician and studied number theory and started my life that way and until Hiroshima. And then after Hiroshima, I had the feeling, well, maybe that's something important that one should pay attention to and uh, that my skills could be used for doing something real in the real world rather than just just theory of numbers. And so I, I had the feeling, well, I, I'd like to do something important and number theory wasn't going to be that important. <laughs> 
so I might as well go into physics. So it, it was, I think it was again the bomb that pushed me into physics. The power of history, and in particular war, to shape the sciences is profound. Scientific progress isn't immune to the tides of the wider culture, and that's another thing that the history of science helps us appreciate and work with and against more clearly. Here's Brian talking with David about the cycles of boom and bust in the 20th century. There were these two phases, and you mentioned them just just now um, uh, in, in this in this short interview. You know, we had this sort of atomic. Well, actually, really three 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 major episodes of the 20th century: the atomic revolution, uh, the quantum revolution, if you will, in the early part. Then the World War II years, which really was a huge impetus for for continued growth in physics, and then the space race, which inspired you and me and many other people. Mm-hmm. Um, and last night, you know, another topic, you know, Buzz Aldrin was was discussing. Um, you know, so we really don't have that nowadays. And, mm-hmm. and the hippies that say physics, you know, they're, they're to be admired because – and I encourage everyone to, to buy two copies <laughs> and the audio book for good measure. Um, but, uh, but, in, uh, but, but in essence, you know, this was kind of this post-war, you know, post-space age. Po- you know, it was kind of the – this denouement of mm-hmm. the 20th century contributions that physics had made. And yet they still – they found these uh, ungainly avenues that people really – are only beginning now and, you know, 30 years, 40 years mm-hmm. after the events depicted in your book. Um, really now touching on that. In David's book, How the Hippies Saved Physics, Science, Counterculture, and the Quantum Revival, he tracks how cultural and institutional constraints placed limits on the kinds of research being done in physics in the 70s. In broad terms, fewer opportunities and less funding stifled research. But he charts the exciting and particularly playful ways that the top young minds of the era worked with and against those constraints to find creative ways to tackle the scientific questions of their generation. In particular, he looked at the Fundamental Physics Group at UC Berkeley, which investigated quantum entanglement alongside Eastern mysticism and psychic mind reading. Their work would provide the foundation for quantum information theory. This period, David believes, holds many lessons for younger physicists working today. One thing I was really interested in was what was it like to sort of grow up in the field of physics um, in a period of, of diminished expectations? We know a lot as historians, as scientists, um, about the kind of boom years. So as you described, coming out of World War II and a real hoopla around yeah. the sciences and physics most of all. Uh, the space race, Sputnik and all that, just sort of um, making more and more investment in the sciences, more and more people getting uh, excited about uh, science and technology. And so we, we have, a, as historians, we know pretty well what it was like to grow up in the field um, mm-hmm. in that period of, of sort of expanding horizons and expectations. Um, so I was really curious, what's it like when that when those uh, fortunes came in for a very sudden and reversal and really kind of unexpected or, mm-hmm. or not quite appreciated ahead of time how much the wheels would come off that bus and how quickly. What was it like for people who were very smart, well-trained, worked hard on the problem sets, you know, published articles <laughs> in the right journals, uh, and yet nonetheless were entering, you know, a world that looked very different than when they had themselves grown up in or, or thought they'd be entering? Um, and so they did. They were, you know, a very smart, very playful uh, group by and large, and they were – you know, making do with what they had. So they were they were Im- improvising um, in in the in the lack of what had been a kind of clear institutional home home base, uh, and they you know were just enamored of these big questions like many of us are today. Mm-hmm. What does it all mean? You know, mm-hmm. what's what's the world made of? Kind of questions. Those are, those are still good questions to ask. Um, and I think the parallel with today is we again have seen. Sort of boom and bust cycles in support for scientific research, federal or otherwise, in this country mm-hmm. and abroad. Uh, the job market, as we know, we're looking at our incredibly talented students, uh, doesn't look nearly so rosy mm-hmm. as it has in, at other times in in recent memory. It looks horrible, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, what I think the the kind of um, raised and lowered expectations for a life in science or a life in, in, in scholarship more broadly. I think those have a real kind of recurring, frighteningly recurring um, you know, kind of boom Sickly. and bust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And and so trying to understand what it's like to keep the kind of passions going even when um, when the infrastructure might be under some real strain. 
uh, maybe there's some sort of inspiration we can we can we can find from looking at people who really did weather the storm quite right. frankly quite playfully. Mm-hmm. You know, in this in that case in the 70s, I teach a course at MIT. I love teaching this undergraduate course on um, basically the history of modern physics. We start right. roughly 150 years ago, so we get all the good juicy stuff. We hit these amazing you know uh, kind of disruptions uh, from Albert Einstein with uh, relativity, both special relativity and general relativity. We linger for several weeks on quantum theory as it kind of coalesced in a bumping, scattering, uh, incoherent sort of way. Uh, and then we, we spend you know, a good chunk of the semester on uh, physics and war, looking at World War II, radar and nuclear weapons and dozens and dozens of lesser known uh, defense projects that were uh, not just science-based but often had very specific physics or physical sciences um, inputs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, th- and then we sort of open back out into this kind of what's it like to become a scientist uh, once physics has, has assumed this really quite unusual role in society and politics and so on. And the course was originally being offered, you know, um, no prerequisites op- open to anyone. And it still is open to anyone. But over time, it, is, it has come to cater to mostly um, physics majors, so undergraduates who are studying physics and doing it extremely well. And mm-hmm. they, they can spend, you know, all night every, every few nights on the problem sets and grind through math that even I have trouble with. Mm-hmm. Uh, incredibly gifted students. And so it's kind of fun because I get a lot of them now near the end of their physics studies, at least their undergraduate physics studies. And so some of them will – some at least will say it was fun for them to see where that stuff came from. That, again, as you say, people were um, making mistakes or, or understanding their own equations right. differently than we do now. And that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Why did Einstein think his equation meant that? We might use the same equation but interpret it rather differently. Um, and then for others uh, who would take the course earlier in their studies, they'll tell, come back and tell me. It was great as a kind of roadmap for what's to come. Especially in light of one of quantum mechanics' basic principles, that the role of the observer affects what is being observed, it seems so obvious that our point of view affects our science and that our point of view is only enhanced by a full appreciation of the characters and mistakes that were part of the great insights and hard work of scientific imagination. Ray Armand Trout graduated from UC Berkeley in 1970 and remained in the Bay Area during part of the period covered in David's book. So it only seems right to end with one more of her scientific speculations, this one appropriately quantum in honor of the fundamental physics group on the chirality of neutrinos. This is called chirality. Of course, chirality, most people know the, the um, meaning of that from chemistry which has to do with mirror image molecules that can't be mapped precisely over each other. Um, But this one, I want you to, I mean, you should keep that in mind. But also I was reading something about chirality in the spin of subatomic particles, and specifically neutrinos, I think. Chirality. If I didn't need to do anything, would I? Would I oscillate in two or three dimensions? Would I summon a beholder and change chirality for him? A massless particle passes through the void with no resistance. Ask what it means to pass through the void. Ask how it differs from not passing. That's the kind of question I I always seriously want to to ask, if you're truly passing through a void, what are you passing? (laughs) (laughs) How are you making any progress? Um, I just, how would you know? So, you know, I'm sure there's an answer to all that, but anyway, it occurs to me to ask. That's one of the things that I really enjoy about your poems is, is maybe there's an answer to that, or maybe there's a, like a contested answer, but that the poems don't always, they don't, they probably don't ever really give an answer. It's always... You know, puts the reader in this place of kind of charge, not mm-hmm. knowing what's going yeah. on, <laughs> which is an interesting place to be. Yeah, thank you. Many thanks to our guests, David Kaiser, whose most recent book is How the Hippies Saved Physics, Ray Armand Trout, whose recent new and selected poems is called Partly, and who has a forthcoming chapbook of her poems on physics called Entanglements, and Freeman Dyson, whose most recent book is Birds and Frogs, Selected Papers, 1990 to 2014. Into the Impossible is a podcast of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UC San Diego. 
This podcast is made possible with the support of the Clark Center's patrons and sponsors, including Viasat Inc. and the James B. Axe Family Foundation. Audio production is by Wes Hawkins and Patrick Coleman, produced by Patrick Coleman and Sheldon Brown. Find out more about the Clark Center at imagination.ucsd.edu. And if you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to subscribe on iTunes. We'll be doing one a month with some occasional fun bonus episodes in between. And uh, while you're there, please leave a review. It really helps. And thanks for listening. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one.